Let's move forward and look at some of the problems with pre-existing conditions that infections that may have occurred and complicate pregnancy. We have talked about the TORCH series and as an assessment tool. And when we're looking at TORCH series of blood tests, we're trying to screen for continual or chronic type infections. Here we're looking at a mom who may have had some exposure to rubella, syphilis, herpes, HIV, V, or CMV, or cytomegalia virus. We're also going to be looking here with implementations at assisting with the cultures and antibody levels of these diseases. Are they active and how extensive? If medications are needed, we're going to teach the mom about the administration of these medications and the need for continual use as prescribed. We also may need to prepare the mom for a possible cesarean delivery at term, thus decreasing the baby's exposure to these types of diseases at birth or infections at birth. Now another problem that can develop that can appear as a pregnancy is called a hydactitiform mole. These are not babies that are developing, but in fact a mass that is growing that may mimic pregnancy. Let's look at what this appears like. The first thing you will see is an elevated HCG, which is, remember, the pregnancy hormone. There is enlargement of the uterus, more than what we would expect for the date. In other words, they're going to look at the last menstrual cycle, but see a uterus that is enlarging faster than the baby would have developed. There will be no fetal heart tones. We will not be able to pick up a fetal heart rate. And there will be minimal dark red or brownish vaginal bleeding with grape-like clusters. Nausea and vomiting may be present, maybe even mimicking morning sickness. There may be some associated pregnancy-induced hypertension as well. What are we going to do for this individual who now appears to be pregnant, but is in fact, we're going to find out, is not? What are the implementations that we are going to use? We are going to go in and do a curatage to remove the tissue that's existing. Pregnancy would be discouraged for up to one year to allow for healing. They will be discouraged from the use of an IUD or intrauterine device, and their HCG levels or pregnancy hormone would be monitored for another year, thus tracking whether this is redeveloping. Now as we transition out of this section into the next, we are going to continue to look at some of the factors that can complicate pregnancy. The NCLEX may test you on such topics as, who is at risk for preterm labor? What is the care when preterm labor occurs? How do we care for someone during the induction of labor or artificial rupture of the membranes? And what do we do in the case of a cesarean section or cesarean delivery? Let's look at the first point, risk factors for preterm labor and birth. As we look at this, we need to identify those individuals that we need to track closely. The first population that is identified is the African-American mom. Those individuals that are over the age of 35 or younger than 17 are also at risk for preterm labor. Low socioeconomic status can increase their risk, as well as an individual who had a previously preterm labor or delivery. Medical diseases or medical problems, chronic diseases, can complicate and set the mom up for increased risk for preterm labor, as well as the use of smoking, substance abuse, including drugs and alcohol, or any previous problems during their pregnancy. Now, when a mom presents with premature labor, what do we need to do? This is a mom that comes into the clinic or calls on the phone and says, I feel like I'm having contractions. I have a little bit of show. I think that there's some fluid leaking out of my vagina. We have them come in immediately, but what do we do? One of the things we're going to suggest is the use of bed rest in, again, the sideline position. We know that the left side is the best way. It keeps the baby off the vena cava, increases the oxygen supply. We're going to monitor their uterus for contractions. We're going to have them be checked for daily weights. Here we're looking to see if there's weight gain. We're going to monitor their nutrition and make sure that they're getting adequate nutrients and encourage them to use relaxation techniques. We know that stress can encourage the extension of preterm labor. Some of the drugs that can be used are Yodapar and Brethine. These drugs are beta minics and they relax smooth muscles. Some of the other drugs that are now being used to treat preterm labor include mag sulfate, remember it has a relaxing effect, and calcium channel blockers because they inhibit contractility. Remember, calcium channel blockers like Procardia will prevent calcium from switching the wall and thus decrease the contraction of that uterus. Let's look at assessment for the induction of labor. 
the mom cannot have cephalopelvic disproportion. We do not want to induce labor on an individual who cannot deliver the baby through the pelvis. They need to have a mature vertex presentation. Remember, vertex is the head down position. The head should be engaged and the cervix should be ripe. In other words, there should be effacement and dilatation taking place. Indications for the induction of labor are used when moms have complications and we are concerned about them going into a prolonged labor or in the mom who is quick to deliver, delivering too far from a healthcare facility or birthing center. Let's look at some of these indications. These would include diabetics, those that are post-mature in that the baby has been in utero too long, individuals presenting with pregnancy-induced hypertension that we're concerned about the, how the baby is doing, any fetal jeopardy, and then as I had said, logistical factors, the mom that lives too far from a center for delivery and may go into labor too quickly. Now when we look at the implementation for induction of labor, here we're talking about what actions are we going to take to try and start and continue the laboring process. The first thing we're going to do is check the mom, for, mom via fetal monitoring. We need to know how the baby is doing at this point in time. We're going to monitor the mom's vital signs as well as see how her labor progresses. Amniotomy may be used, amniotomy being the opening of the amniotic sac or, premature, or rupturing of the membranes, ROM. Again, preparing them for an amniotomy would be preparing them to rupture their membranes. We may begin Pitocin via pump. Pitocin is given piggyback never as the mainline ID. It's going to cause contractility of the uterus. And in this case, it's going to be very important for the nurse to observe the contractions every two to three minutes and make sure that none of the more than 90 seconds. Remember when we're using an oxytocin or a drug like Pitocin to cause uterine contractions, we do not want to allow the uterus to become hypertonic. This is when there is not a break between contractions allowing both the mom and the baby to get a rest. If contractions are occurring more frequently or coming close, lasting more than 90 seconds or coming more frequently than every two to three minutes, we need to turn off the Pitocin. There needs to be a rest period between contractions. Now let's look at another problem that can occur. A mom whose labor isn't progressing or has cephalopelvic disproportion or a baby that's malpositioned in utero may need an intervention to help with delivery other than a vaginal delivery. Here we're going to talk about the indications for a cesarean delivery or cesarean section. One of them would be dystocia. This is where there's abnormal labor, the fetal position is not correct, or the mother's pelvis may be a problem as far as delivery. The mom may have had a previous cesarean delivery and thus having a repeat cesarean delivery. The baby could be in a breech presentation. Remember, this is when the baby is not in a head down but in a buttocks or foot down position. Fetal distress could have occurred or have a fetal anomaly that requires an immediate cesarean delivery. Gonorrhea and herpes would be another reason not to allow the baby to go through the birth canal. If the baby develops a prolapsed umbilical cord and it's going to be impossible to deliver the baby quickly, vaginally, we are going to go in and do a cesarean delivery so that the cord is not further compressed or pulled. Pregnancy-induced hypertension would also be an indication for a cesarean delivery, as well as the mom that could be presenting with placenta previa or a abruptio placenta. Now when we start to talk about cesarean deliveries, we have to remember this is a mom going through a birthing process, not expecting to be delivered under a surgical procedure. Cesarean deliveries are a surgical procedure and thus tre treated like any other post-op patient as well as a new mom. Let's look at what we would do nursing-wise. The first thing we need to do is make sure we provide them with emotional support. If they have gone through Lamaze training and have planned to have their husband present and deliver the baby through the vaginal canal, they're going to be somewhat disappointed to have to go into a surgical procedure. We are going to administer for them lower dose pre-op medication. Again, we do not want this medication in large doses to cross into the baby and cause fetal depression. We are going to monitor them for hemorrhage by checking their fundus and incision site both in the pre- and post-delivery period and watch their vital signs. We are going to provide them with comfort measures, 
during the delivery through medication, usually an epidural or spinal block, and in the post-op period by teaching them how to splint, position, and change um, the baby's placement on their abdomen during holding. We're going to encourage them also to provide some bonding with the baby. Again, oftentimes these babies are whisked off from the mom's side before they've even been able to touch the child because the baby may have been at risk. It's important to get the mom and baby together as soon as possible to enhance bonding. If the mom cannot be present in the nursery, maybe their support person or the baby's father could be there. There is pressure during delivery and the mom needs to be aware of that. Cesarean deliveries can be scary, especially if they are not prepared for them. There's two types of incisions that can be used. The first one is a vertical incision. Vertical incisions, or the up and down incision, is used during an emergency procedure. The baby can be get, gotten out quickly and, and saved from any further hypoxia, but bleeding is increased and the post-op period can be a little more uncomfortable and a little more cumbersome. The transverse is the lower pubic bone type incision that goes side to side. In this case, the mom can have a baby again at a later time and go into labor, or what's called a VBAC, vaginal birth after a cesarean. The transverse incision, or side to side incision, has less muscle cut through it and then also less bleeding. Let's go on and look at another problem that could develop. Precipitous deliveries are deliveries that occur outside the hospital setting or in rapid succession. They occur on highways in people's home during ice storms. This is a baby that comes about too quickly and the mom cannot get to her treatment center fast enough. Let's look at what the mom needs at this time. If the mom develops a precipitous or quick delivery, we need to remain with her. We need to prepare the environment to be as sterile and clean as possible. In addition, as this baby is born, it's very rapidly progressing out of the body. We need to slow it down. Otherwise, it's going to do a lot of tissue trauma to the mom's um, birthing canal. So by applying a slight amount of pressure to the top of the baby's head, you can slow down that delivery. Rotating the baby's head as it emerges allows us to be able to open its airway and clean out any secretions that might be in its mouth. We also here want to help with, by rotating the head, the delivery of the shoulders and trunk of the body. The baby at that point would be dried and placed up on the mom's abdomen. She can then touch the baby. The baby is in a nice head down position because the uterus is distended, head towards the mom. And at this point, we can then continue to check for bleeding and check fundal tone. The mom's body can keep the baby warm and the baby would also be covered. Now what are some other complications that can occur maternally? Let's look at some of the things that can occur in the post-op period regardless of the form of delivery. Some of the things that the NCLEX will want you to be able to tell them is what are the symptoms of and care of maternal hemorrhage, maternal infection, and postpartum depression. Let's begin by looking at the assessment of postpartum hemorrhage, hemorrhage in the postpartum period. Here the mom is going to present with a boggy uterus. A boggy uterus feels spongy. As you touch your hand on the top of the symphysis pubis below the umbilicus, you're going to feel something that is not firm and round, but spongy in appearance. We're going to see excessive bleeding. The lochia, or bleeding that's taking place, regresses to a previous stage. In that, if we have something that looks more serosanguis in, in nature or darker in color, we would regress or digress back to something brighter in color. The mom may have had a history of lacerations at the delivery period. The baby progressed too quickly out of the birth canal or there could be retained placenta fragments that would also appear as postpartum hemorrhage. Over distension of the uterus also sets the mom up for problems with bleeding in the postpartum period as well as a prolonged labor. Now if the mom is presenting with hemorrhage and during this period of time we are going to treat them very much like anyone else bleeding from a, from a surgical incision or other type of chronic problem. But there's some additional things we can do for this mom to help. One of the things that we want to do is lightly massage the uterus until firm. We only massage uteruses that are not firm. If the uterus is firm, there is no reason to aggressively massage the uterus. In fact, it can be inverted. We may decide to start the mom back on an oxytocin like Pitocin. Give her a little bit of boost of the hormone that causes contractility of the uterus. During this period of time, we're going to be monitoring her vital signs as well as her hemoglobin hematocrit, counting the number of pads she's going through as far as the lochial bleeding. But we also are going to watch her for whether or not this is going to progress into any further problem. Another problem that can occur in the postpartum period is infection. So as we start to think about what we would see, we need to remember what the typical signs of infection are. 
the mom doesn't differ. Let's begin by looking at temperature. Temperatures above 100.4 degrees or higher would be a problem or a sign that an infection may be developing. We also might see chills, tachycardia, or abdominal pain in the mom. The lochia may become very foul-smelling in nature, and there may be some localized tenderness across the abdomen. While evaluating lab tests like cultures and WBC counts, we would see an increase in the WBC count in response to infection. What types of things do we do for the mom that's developing infection? Here again, it does not differ from what we've encouraged other individuals to do when treating an, or preventing an infection. Some of the things that we might be using here to help with infection issues are teaching the mom prevention of infection. In this case, we can encourage early ambulation. We can ask her to change her peri pads frequently, thus keeping her more clean and dry. Encouraging good nutrition and fluids, as well as monitoring for signs of infection. If these things have not helped or prevented infection, we are going to start with administering antibiotics. We are, in addition, also going to, at this point, go back and continuing to encourage the mom to ambulate, continuing to encourage her to get good rest, giving her fluids and nutrition, and then still encouraging her to change the peri pads. So these actions could be used both preventatively and treatment-wise for infection. When we're assessing the mom for postpartum depression, we're going to see the symptoms start to arise sometime between three and seven days after delivery. It's a roller coaster of emotions with things up and down, her at high times and then very low times, and can be cyclic throughout the day. There is a letdown feeling. There's a change in, in circulating hormones at this point. And so she ha not only has fatigue, but may have some changes in her appetite and sleep disturbances. This would be in addition to what you would normally expect to see in a new mom. At that point, most of us would be fatigued. Most of us would be having some disruption in sleep. But these are more pronounced. What do we do for the mom that has postpartum depression? I would hope the first thing we would do as a nurse is encourage verbalization of feelings. Get them to talk about what their expectations were. Try and make sure their expectations are reasonable and that they're not being too hard on themselves. We need to assess them for potential signs of suicide. If, in fact, we would notice any signs that the patient is becoming suicidal, we would need to um, intervene by having them contact or by ourselves contacting their physician. Support groups can be used, and this encourages the moms to share experiences and feelings associated with their delivery. If the depression is prolonged, although never showing signs of suicidal ideation, we would still want to encourage them to talk to their physician about these feelings. Let's move out of this period and move into what the baby looks like during a normal childbirth. What does the NCLEX ask you related to the childbearing of a neonatal as far as normally? Here what we need to know is how to perform the newborn assessment and newborn findings related to or normal findings related to this newborn assessment. What is included in a newborn assessment? We talked earlier about the APGAR score. What's included in it and how do we measure it? Let's look at the APGAR score as far as how it's scored. APGAR score is a one, it's done at one to five minutes of age and looks at cardiac tone, respirations, muscle tone, reflexes, and color. We are going to evaluate this baby with the potential score of 10. Each category has a rating of 0 to 2. A baby in the poor range will have a total number between 0 and 3, in the fair range between 4 and 6, and in the excellent range between 7 and 10. Parents are usually aware of what these numbers mean. So if a child had a low APGAR rating, we would need to encourage them to vent their feelings and answer their questions and concerns, if at all possible. Now, what else are we assessing for before, besides the APGAR in a newborn baby? One of the things we're looking at here is their weight. The normal baby weighs between 6 and 9 pounds, or 2,700 to 4,000 grams. They will lose 5 to 10 percent of this body weight in the first few days. Remember, babies have a large fluid volume. It will be regained in one to two weeks. Another thing that we will see is that their length is normally 19 to 21 inches, or 48 to 53 centimeters. The head circumference is usually 13 to 14 inches. This is important to recognize in order to pick up problems like hydrocephalus, or increased fluid on the brain. The chest is 12 to 13 inches in size, and blood pressure usually ranges somewhere around 65 over 41 in either the arm or the calf. 
Fluctuations in body temperature are frequent with the newborn baby. They are usually put in a warming unit and a little hat applied. Remember, temperature fluctuates in the newborn baby. What else are we going to see in this newborn? Hopefully we're going to see a baby that is developing, for, um, remaining in the fetal position for a few days. They enjoy staying very curled up in a little ball. That's how they have laid for nine months and it keeps them warm and comfortable. The other thing we may see is the skin taking on a reddish coloration the first few hours after delivery. Acrocyanosis can also be present around the mouth or buccal cavity or extend also into the hands and feet. This can occur up to 24 hours. Keeping the baby warm helps to diminish some of the acrocyanosis. Vernex cheesiosa is a normal cheesy condition that occurs like gray, white in color, and it's fat that is accumulated on the baby's skin. This should not be removed as it acts as a lubricant or moisturizer for, for the baby's skin. Lanugo is that downy type or fine hair that appears over the shoulders, forehead, and cheeks of the newborn. Melia is the little white sebaceous gland type things that we see across the forehead, nose, cheeks, and chin of the newborn baby. And as we continue to go into newborn assessment, we're going to come across some skin type changes that are normal, not abnormal in nature. Let's talk first about Mongolian spots. Mongolian spots are normal in the newborn baby. They appear as grayish blue pigmentation over the buttocks or back. Other birthmarks that we might see would be stork bites. Stork bites are small capillary dilatations that occur on the nose and eyelids or neck of the baby. Strawberry marks may also appear. These appear as raised, dark, red areas that do go away over time. The port wine stains that can appear on the face and neck also go away over, do not go away over time. They remain flat, red, and are usually, again, over the face and neck. Remember here that a mom who discovers that the child has a port wine stain may need some psychosocial support. The baby has a skin disorder that does not allow it to appear like we would see in a magazine like the Gerber baby. This, this port wine stain will not disappear over time. The others would. Let's go on to talk about some of the changes we might see within the head, especially as associated with the fontanelles. The fontanelles at birth are usually very, they're the soft spots on our head. There's an anterior one that is diamond shaped, 2.5 to 4 centimeters, and closes by 18 months of age. The posterior one is more triangular in shape and is 0.5 to 1 centimeters, closing sometime between the 8 and 12 week period of time. Again, fontanelles can be used to evaluate hydration in the newborn. As we move on, let's talk about what a cephalohematoma can look like. This is swelling that occurs or a collection of blood that can disappear for w over a week or a month period of time. It does not cross the suture lane, thus it's limited to one side of the head. Caput sussendatum is a condition where the swelling overrides the suture line of the scalp. The fluid is eventually reabsorbed, and these are children that oftentimes are referred to as having an egghead. They have a funny little growth on the side of their head. This will go away over time. Elevating the head is not going to help it disappear any more quickly. The fluid gets absorbed again over time. Let's go on to look at what we see with the umbilical cord of a newborn baby. When we are assessing the umbilical cord, it's important to notice that initially it is white and gelatous in nature. It will eventually shrivel, turn black over the next two to three days and should fall off within one to two weeks. When we discuss umbilical cords, it's important to remember the teaching necessary with the mom in the care of the umbilical cord. The mom needs to keep it clean and dry. Alcohol or dyes can be used to try and help the cord dry more quickly. The diaper needs to be rolled back away from it and the baby does not receive any tub baths until the cord has dropped off. They need to be taught how to observe for infection, signs of redness or drainage. Let's go on to look at the GI function of the newborn. When we evaluate the stool of a newborn baby, it initially begins as merconium, which is passed within the first 12 to 24 hours. It is thin greenish brown transitional stool that then follows by day three. As a baby develops feeding patterns and has taken in some protein or milk type sources, the, the stool will take on a yellow appearance. One to two pale yellow to light brown stools a day will occur in a formula fed baby and golden yellow stool will appear in a breast fed baby usually following each feeding. Let's go on now to look at some of the nervous system type um, assessment findings that we will see in this newborn. We'll begin by looking at some of the reflexes that are present that eventually disappear over time. The first one we're going to look at is a rooting reflex. 
the rooting reflex is a sucking that appears that will disappear sometime by the fourth to seven month. This is a child that appears to have sucked their thumb, or as soon as anything comes in close contact with the mouth, they latch on and begin to suck. The palmar grasp is a grasp that occurs um, where the child, if something is placed in the hand, they instinctively will close it. This is not something that they do or are doing with a conscious thought. It fades between three to four months and then will develop as a learned behavior later. Planter grasp is something that lessens by the eighth month. Here's where the toes um, flex on stimulation. The tonic neck reflex disappears sometime between three to four months. Remember, this is that fencing position that the baby takes on. Arm and hand turned to the side and looks like they're in a fencing match. Some of the other reflexes that we're going to evaluate in this baby would include the Moro reflex. The Moro reflex is a startle reflex that disappears by the age of three to four months. The stepping reflex is where the mom and dad can be very excited to see their baby when they are stood on a tabletop dancing their feet. This too fades at four to five months and the baby later learns how to step correctly. The Babinski reflex is interesting to remember about for the NCLEX. The Babinski reflex in an adult is different than what we see in a newborn and the infant's Babinski reflex does not revert to the adults until 12 months of age. Remember the baby has normally a positive Babinski at birth, which means that its toes flare on stimulation instead of curling down. In an adult, that would be an abnormal finding. In the newborn up to 12 months, it is considered normal. Let's go on to look at some of the things we will do with the newborn baby during this initial period. One of the first things that you should be thinking of is airway. We need to make sure that we have established and maintained the airway of the newborn. We're going to observe the APGAR at both one and five minutes and clamp the umbilical cord. The baby should be kept warm and an ID band again will be placed on the mom and infant. We will administer prophylactic eye medications, erythromycin, tetracycline, and silver nitrate. Most frequently used is erythromycin and administer vitamin K. The newborn baby has an immature liver and has an inability to clot effectively. Thus, we will give them vitamin K in an injection form. Some of, the other Im, Im, some of the other interventions that we are going to use with this newborn would include documenting their first stool and urine, color, consistency, and amount. We are going to weigh and measure the baby. The next thing that we're going to look for here is to observe the infant and mother bonding process. How are they doing together? How does the mom feel about her new acquired skills and responsibilities? We're going to begin by giving the baby a feeding. We're going to look for signs of readiness. We're going to be monitoring their blood sugar level. We're going to institute care of the umbilical cord and if circumcised or uncircumcised, promote some kind of care to the penis. If the baby is uncircumcised, the mom needs to be taught or dad that the foreskin does not have to be retracted aggressively in order to clean it. The penis should simply, simply be cleaned with soap and water. If, in fact, the circumcision has taken place, the baby needs to be kept clean, the diaper away from the area of the circumcision. A permit would have been signed by the parents, and they need to understand that this is not a mandatory thing that needs to be done initially at birth. A and D ointment may be used, Vaseline gauze could be on, or a plastibel is a device that could be attached and will then fall off at a later time, thus doing the circumcision over a few day period of time instead of immediately. Let's move forward and look at some other problems that can develop in the newborn. Neonatal complications that you will need to know on the NCLEX include identification and care of respiratory distress syndrome, differentiation between the types of hyperbilirubinemia, symptoms and care of the infant with hypoglycemia, an assessment and care of narcotic addicted infants, as well as symptoms and care during cold stress. We're going to begin by looking at respiratory distress syndrome. Remember that respiratory distress syndrome can occur any time after delivery up to two and three days into the postpartum period. The baby usually presents with labored respirations after hours of normal breathing, cyanosis, grunting and nasal flaring, retractions of the sternum and rib cage as well as tachypnea, and unresponsiveness apneic and apneic episodes. It's important to identify babies that may be at risk of respiratory distress syndrome during both the prenatal and postnatal period. 
Now, as this problem develops, what would be some of our nursing interventions? Implementations that we might use would be those things to try and conserve oxygen, to help with consumption of oxygen, getting it where it needs to be. The baby needs to have its temperature maintained. Remember, a baby that becomes cold uses more oxygen. Maintaining a neutral thermal environment is also important. The baby is going to be put in a warmer as well as a hat applied. TPN may be used, total parental nutrition, where the baby will receive its nutrient support by vein in lieu of feedings. Sucking requires energy and uses oxygen. In addition to TPN, gavage feeding might be used as well. Positioning the baby on their side with a small blanket folded under their head in a nice anatomical alignment without the head hyperextended helps to maintain ease of breathing, drop the diaphragm, and keep the airway open. Medications that can be administered at this time could be antibiotics, diuretics, vitamin E, or surfactant. If the baby requires oxygen support, it may be necessary to use PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure, or CPAP in order to keep the airways open and get oxygen through the alveoli into the circulatory system. Let's move on and look at another problem in the, prenatal per in the perinatal period. Perinatal asphyxia is when the baby has been exposed to some type of hypoxic episode in utero. During the laboring process, as the, the membranes rupture, the fluid that comes out of the, am, the amniotic fluid that is expelled through the vagina will be merconium in stained or color. There may also be, following delivery, increased intracranial damage, altered fontanelles, seizure activity, and bradycardia. This baby has been hypoxic and may be eliciting signs of increased intracranial pressure. The baby may appear cyanotic and have an altered respiratory pattern. What do we need to do for this infant to try and help them out of this emergency situation? Implementations will include aggressive ventilatory assistance. This is an emergency period. We need to keep the airway open and get the baby stabilized. We're going to talk about hyperbilirubinemia that occurs because the body is breaking down red blood cells quickly. They're usually immature in nature, and it can produce a couple different types of jaundice. Let's look at the first one, physiologic jaundice. Physiologic jaundice is caused by an immature, immature liver function. It is usually seen within the first, after 24 hours from delivery and peaks at 72 hours. It usually lasts from five to seven days, and no treatment besides possible hydration or a little sunlight in the living room is necessary. Hyperbilirubinemia can also occur in breastfed babies with an associated jaundice. These children will have, uh, develop jaundice in response to a poor milk intake. If we do not have enough fluid ingested, the circulating red blood cells that are breaking down kind of accumulate and the jaundice will appear. Hydration will help eliminate this. So what we're going to look for here is the onset two to three days after delivery and peaking during this two to three day period of time. Usually it is treated by increased breastfeeding or if necessary, additional hydration. Hyperbilirubinemia can also occur because of a factor found in breast milk. Let's look at this. Again, this would occur because there's a factor in the breast milk that is promoting jaundice. It occurs at four to five days after delivery and peaks at the 10 to 15 day period of time. The treatment for this involves discontinuing the breastfeeding for 24 hours. What is happening here is that the baby is reacting to the mother's antigen and antibody levels. The next type we're going to talk about is hemolytic disease. In this case, jaundice develops because of a problem from the blood antigen incompatibility. It occurs in the first 24 hours after delivery, and the peak is variable. Treatment for this problem is phototherapy or possibly exchange transfusions if the belly rubin level becomes too high. What we want to do here is prevent this from occurring by looking at RH incompatibility as a preventative measure. Let's move forward and look at another problem that can develop in the newborn baby. Necrotizing enterocolitis is a problem that attacks the GI system. When the baby develops this problem, we will see bile, colored vomiting, a distended abdomen, and hypothermia. Onset usually occurs four to 10 days after the feedings are started. 
And we would treat this problem by making the baby NPO for 24 to 48 hours, administering antibiotics, and supporting their nutritional needs through the use of TPN, or total parental nutrition. Now, another problem that develops in babies frequently after delivery, if there's been a long labor or their mom had gestational diabetes, is hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is frequently tested on the NCLEX. Let's look at what the baby would look like. One of the symptoms we're going to see, or signs, is going to be a blood sugar that is less than 40 milligrams per deciliter in the first 24 hours. The baby, like us, appears jittery. They have irregular respirations, and the baby can become slightly cyanotic. They become weak, lack of energy, and their pitch becomes, um, cry becomes very high-pitched. They may appear lethargic, especially if they had been alert earlier. And there may be some twitching or eye rolling and seizures if we do not correct the hypoglycemia fast enough. It's important when looking at indications for hypoglycemia to evaluate the babies that might be at risk at developing this. We are looking for babies that are large for gestational age, moms that had gestational diabetes, and any mom who had a long stressful labor. What do we do here for this baby? Remember, the first thing is to assess. We need to make sure that the jitteriness and lethargy and changes in cry are actually associated with hypoglycemia. Check their blood glucose. Then we need to administer some form of glucose, either in sugar water or some higher source if necessary. And we need to get the baby feeding. Another problem that can develop for babies is a baby that comes from a narcotic addicted mom. These babies present with symptoms of withdrawal from drug addiction and need to be monitored in the postpartum period. Let's look at this newborn baby. This baby will appear with a very high-pitched cry. They will have hyperreflexes, and there will be a decreased ability to sleep. Oftentimes, their respiratory rate is very tachypnic, greater than 60 respirations per minute. They may have some frequent sneezing or yawning, and these symptoms usually appear sometime within the first 12 to 24 hours, but could possibly be delayed up to 7 to 10 days. Their withdrawal is definitely based on when and how frequently the mom used drugs. If she has been shooting something up every 12 or 24 hours, we're going to see the baby's withdrawal during that same time period. If she had less frequent use of drugs, then the baby's withdrawal could be over a longer period of time. What do we do for the baby that is having narcotic um, withdrawal? What we need to start with is assessing their muscle tone, irritability, and vital signs. It's important to get a baseline to find out if our interventions are working and if the baby is improving or deteriorating. We are going to administer medications such as phenobarbital to help with sedation, chlorpromazine, diazepam, or paragoric. Here we are trying to help with decreasing the withdrawal and limiting the potential seizure activity that may occur. We want to try and help the baby stay relaxed. We are going to decrease or reduce the environmental stimuli and keep the baby wrapped snugly, rock them, and hold them tightly. Now another problem that can develop in this neonatal period is cold stress. Cold stress occurs when the baby cannot handle its temperature regulating and becomes chilled. Let's look at what they would look like. One of the things we're going to see is modeling of the skin and cyanosis. They also, because of hypoxia and chilling, will develop metabolic acidosis and hypoglycemia. Remember, with shivering, we use oxygen as well as sugar to compensate. Implementations would include getting the baby into a heated environment and maintaining a neutral thermal environment. This is where we might pay, place a fabric insulated cap on the baby's head and keep them wrapped tightly in a blanket. Another complication that the baby may um, occur in the neonatal period would be neonatal sepsis. Neonatal sepsis is an infection that occurs in the baby in the postpartum or neonatal period. Assessment findings would include hypothermia and lethargy, a poor suck, and periods of apnea. In order to pr treat this infection, it's important for us to start antibiotic therapy, and it will be continued for 7 to 10 days. We'll administer oxygen and temporarily discourage or discontinue oral feedings. The baby, in this case, again, needs to conserve its energy. Transfusions may be indicated if the baby continues to deteriorate. We're now going to move out of this prenatal, neonatal, postpartum 
newborn area, and move into conditions associated with reproduction. Some of the things that you need to know in the NCLEX in relationship to reproduction include how and when to perform breast self-exam, how and when to perform testicular exam, methods of contraception, their effectiveness and the teaching surrounding them, and how to care for patients with internal radioactive implants. We're going to begin by looking at breast self-exam. Remember that the new NCLEX is looking at health promotion behaviors, wellness focused. It's important for us to teach prevention and identification of problems in their early stages. When we start to look at breast self-exam, it's important to know when do you do it. Breast self-exam is performed one week after the onset of menstruation or your period or any other designated day during the month if in at the postmenopausal stage. It begins at age 18, as well as a pap exam would also begin at this time or earlier. You need to inspect the breasts in the mirror. Are they symmetrical? Are there any changes in their color or configuration when compared? We're going to examine the breasts with arms at the side and then with our arms above our head and hands on our hip, three positions. Again, we're looking for symmetry. Is anything unusual in comparison? Or is there a change from the previous month? We use the finger pads of the three metal fingers to feel the breasts. We are looking for lumps. We are also looking for any dimpling, discharge, or other types of changes occurring in the breast. Mammography is another protective mechanism used to try and identify problems within the breast in the early stages. Mammography baseline should be done between the ages of 35 and 39. Again, should continue at the ages of 40 to 49 every two years. After the age of 50, mammograms should be done yearly. Let's go on and look at testicular self-examination. Again, this should start at the age of 18, and the individual or gentleman would support the testes in the palm of their hand. They palpate between the thumb and forefinger. This is best performed when the cremaster muscles are in a relaxed position and the testes are in a pendulous position. Again, it should be started at age 18, and it's to develop an idea of what is normal, anything that would feel unusual when compared to the previous month would need to be reported. We're going to move from self-exams into contraception, prevention of pregnancy, and we're going to begin first by looking at oral contraception. Oral contraception inhibits the release of the follicular stimulating, follicle stimulating hormone, and it has side effects such as nausea and vaginal infections. Birth control pills are contraindicated in individuals with hypertension, a history of thromboembolytic disease, or a diabetes mellitus. It should, the pill should be taken at the same time each day, orally, and if a pill is missed, take it as soon as it's remembered. If the individual has missed two pills simultaneously or back-to-back, -back, it's important to use an alternative form of birth control for the remainder of that cycle or month. It's important here to think about what else the individual needs to be taught centering around birth control pills. They need to make sure that any medication they are taking has been cleared by a physician. Some medications will interfere with the absorption and effectiveness of birth control pills. Let's go on to look at another type of contraception, the intrauterine device. An intrauterine device is, it causes degeneration of the fertilized egg and prevents implantation. This is a device that is floating within the uterine cavity or slightly against the wall and prevents this fertilized egg from becoming comfortable. It's inserted by a physician during the menstrual period, and side effects include cramping, excessive menstrual flow, as well as infection. It's important for the client to check the presence of the string at least monthly and report any unusual cramping, late period, or spotting, as well, of course, of any signs of infection. Another type of birth control is the use of the condom. Frequently, teenagers feel that this is an effective way to prevent pregnancy. This is an effective way to prevent STDs, but is not as effective as these other two methods in the prevention of pregnancy. Let's look at use of a condom. The condom prevents sperm from entering the vagina. It also can help with the prevention of venereal diseases. It is applied with the penis erect and room at the tip or end for expansion. A water-soluble lubricant can be used to ease an insertion but it should not be an oil-based or petroleum product such as Vaseline. 
This would destroy the condom, which is a rubber product. When the, when the penis is being withdrawn from the vagina, it's important to hold the rim of the condom so that it is not left in the vaginal cavity or does not come loose or fall off. If during intercourse the condom was to break, it would be important for the partner to use a contraceptive foam and insert it as soon as possible. Another form of contraception is the diaphragm. The diaphragm prevents sperm from entering the cervix. It's fitted by a healthcare worker, but does carry a risk of urinary tract infections and toxic shock syndrome. It should not be inserted more than six hours prior to intercourse and is best used with a spermicidal jelly, which would be applied to the rim and dome. Removal should occur at least every 24 hours, again, to decrease the risk of toxic shock syndrome. Another type of birth control is spermicidal or vaginal jellies. What we're looking at here is the ability to try and interfere with the viability of sperm. We are going to here try and kill the sperm before it can impregnate or fertilize the ovum. It must be inserted before each act of intercourse and any allergic symptoms should be reported to the physician. There's two remaining types of contraceptions that we're going to discuss. One is going to be steroid implants, the other one rhythm. Let's begin by looking at steroid implants. Steroid implants are, are put in and require surgical intervention for both insertion and removal, but are effective for up to five years. Some of the side effects associated with a steroid implant include irregular bleeding, nausea, and skin changes. The last type of, of effective birth control is the rhythm method. When we begin to look at this, rhythm method is looking at the periodic absence of intercourse during a, fertile, during a fertile period. Fertile periods are determined by looking at a drop in your basal body temperature before and a slight rise after ovulation. The temperature is checked upon arising before you get out of bed in the morning. The individual also watches for changes in the cervical mucus. It will go from being thick, cloudy, and sticky to abundant, clear, thin, and slippery at the time of ovulation. This method of contraception is not used as frequently for birth control in this country as much as it's used to try and identify signs of ovulation in the treatment of infertility. Let's look at one last section that is coded under methods of contraception, coitus interruptus. This is where the man withdraws a penis before ejaculation and avoids depositing sperm in the vagina. The reason that I have not included this as a type of birth control is that men leak sperm during any form of intercourse prior to ejaculation. This is not an effective way to prevent pregnancy. Some of the permanent types of contraceptive devices or changes in the ability to become pregnant are in vasectomies and tubal ligations. Let's look at these two procedures. When we perform a vasectomy, we are attempting to terminate the passage of sperm through the vas deferens so that sperm cannot be deposited during ejaculation in the vaginal cavity. It is done under local anesthesia and they are administered a mild analgesic, ice packs, and scrotal support or elevation following the procedure. Birth control needs to be continued for two to three month period of time until we have gotten back to sperm free analysis. Let's look at the female side of permanent contraception control. Here we're looking at an issue of tubal ligation. With tubal ligation, the fallopian tubes are either tied, cauterized, or cut. Intercourse can be resumed as soon as bleeding has ceased. There is no way for the egg to get into the uterus, thus there is no risk, even though ovulation continues, of the egg becoming fertilized. Now we're going to look at some reproductive type problems, namely infections. The first thing that we're going to look at is candida. Candida appears as an odorless, cheesy white discharge and is presented with itching and an inflamed vagina. The types of actions that we implement here is the use of gynolotrium type creams or mycostatin. Again, we are trying to eliminate the candida. We also need to evaluate this patient for any signs of diabetes. Candida can be a symptom, early sign of diabetics or increased blood sugar. The next problem we're going to look at briefly is toxic shock syndrome. 
Toxic shock syndrome is something that promotes or presents as a shock system. There's a sudden onset of fever associated with infection. Vomiting and diarrhea are hallmarks in this type of shock with hypotension and a reddish rash on the palms and soles of the feet. The immediate interventions have to include hydration. We need to prevent shock, so don't forget what the underlying disease process is. In addition, because we are looking at infections, we need to institute antibiotics. The individual also needs to be educated about the correct use and frequent changing and size of tampons. Toxic shock syndrome can affect multiple systems of the body. These range from the renal, GI, central nervous, and circulatory systems. Pelvic inflammatory disease is the next problem we're going to discuss. Pelvic inflammatory disease presents with malaise, fever, abdominal pain, leukocytosis, remember this is changes in white count, and vaginal discharge. The abdomen becomes very tender, especially in the lower region, and the vaginal discharge at times can be very purulent in nature. In treating this, it's important to administer antibiotics to treat the infection, as well as warm douches. Fluids may also be indicated if the patient is developing signs of hypotension. This problem can cause permanent sterility, so it's important to teach individuals how to prevent the development of pelvic inflammatory disease. Let's go on and look at mastitis. Mastitis presents in women as a red inflamed breast with possible exudate from the nipple. There is fever and again leukocytosis, mastitis, inflammation, usually signifying infection. When we have infection, it's important for us to begin by giving systemic antibiotics. This is not something that's local and must be treated from within the bloodstream. Warm packs can be added for comfort and additional breast support might be needed. Mastitis being an acute problem, breast cancer is the next thing we're going to discuss, is not an acute incident. This can become a chronic problem. Let's look at some of the signs and symptoms associated with breast cancer. The patient may find a small, mobile, painless lump in the breast. And remember, this does not have to be just in the breast tissue, but in the axilla as well. There may be some puckering of the skin and nipple retraction. When we look at implementation, initially the physician may decide to try a needle biopsy to find out first is this a fluid cyst or actually a cancerous lump and do some cancer screening on it. Mammography screening could be indicated to look at the size and location compared to previous mammographies. Surgery will be indicated if it's identified that it needs to be removed. The surgery, of course, can contain removing the lump as well as the entire breast. Radiation and the chemotherapy can be instituted both together and singly, depending on the type of carcinoma and its location. Breast cancer is usually fairly fast growing, and as soon as an individual finds a lump in the breast, they're concerned that this might be cancer. It's important for individuals to know the difference between fibrocystic disease, which is not cancerous, and breast cancer. Fibrocystic changes change with our cycle, and the lump is usually soft in nature. So moms need to, or women need to be taught how to evaluate the changes in their breasts so they can identify those changes that might be indicative of breast cancer. Let's go on and look at another female problem, endometriosis. Endometriosis is something that occurs when the endometrial lining becomes inflamed and displaced from the uterine cavity. This can occur following surgeries. It produces pain and dysmenorrhea. They can also develop infertility because it can cause scarring and striation. Back pain is usually present. It is not unusual to find young, nulpotiparous individuals or those before childbearing developing signs of endometriosis, which will usually be resolved following delivery of the first baby. Implementations for endometriosis include the use of oral contraceptions, surgical removal of the tissue if necessary, and childbirth or and lactation. Uterine cancer is another type of problem that can affect the uterine lining. Again, this becomes a chronic problem with a poor outcome at times. Let's look at the signs of uterine cancer. Uterine cancer can be assessed by finding watery discharge, an irregular menstrual bleeding, and menorrhagia. Let's look at the implementations. An individual with uterine cancer usually will receive an internal radiation implant and possibly hysterectomy. This can be a subtotal 
or total and can be done either vaginally or abdominally. Now we will talk a little bit briefly here about internal radiation, but there is a cancer discussion in physiologic adaptation that will go over the details of the type of radiation used for various cancers. Let's move on and look at internal radiation implants. Internal radiation implants require the individual to be on bed rest. Enemas, low residue diet, and fluids are given. Enemas are given to prevent them from ba bearing down and possibly expelling, expelling the radiation implant. Indwelling catheters may be used or a fracture pan to limit the activity. The sealed source, or that which would be contained in a cavity, we do not want to become dislodged until time. You want to limit exposure time and distance to the individual with the implant. Again, remembering with a sealed source, urine and feces are not radioactive. If we were to use an unsealed source, an IV form, the body's secretions would become radioactive. A long-handled forcep and a lead-lined container should be in the room in order to allow for the device to be dropped in if, in fact, it was to be dropped out of the body. We need to be able to protect the environment from the radiation. Let's go on and look at ovarian cancers. Ovarian cancer is presented with a, with a family history of cancer, infertility, and very heavy menses or periods. Implementation occurs by surgical removal, chemotherapy, and of course, with, as with all cancers, emotional support. The last disorder we're going to discuss during this time period is benign prostatic hypertrophy, or BPH. Benign prostatic hypertrophy occurs in men and presents with dysuria, frequency, urination, urinary free urgency, and nocturia, or the need to urinate at night. Some of the things that we will do is provide a continuous bladder irrigation. This would occur after a TERP was performed, or transurethral resection of the prostate. This is where we go in and scrape part of, the, part of the prostatic tissue in order to allow a larger opening for the elimination of urine. Traction is kept on the catheter for the first 24 hours to decrease bleeding, and then bladder retraining is initiated in the post-op period. The individual is discouraged from any heavy lifting, and we need to monitor any clots or blood that may form encouraging them to drink a lot of liquids. This ends part two of health promotion and maintenance. I look forward to seeing you in part three. Welcome to part three of health promotion and maintenance. In this section, we're going to be looking at prevention and early detection of diseases, primarily health assessment type things. Let's move forward. Well, as we identify prevention and early detection of diseases, some of the things that you need to know on the NCLEX include screening tests needed at different age groups, contraindications to immunizations, the normal immunization schedule, side effects and care following immunizations, and symptoms and care for allergic responses. Let's begin by looking at health type behaviors. Let's begin, we'll look at exercise. The purpose of exercise is to improve cardiovascular functioning, decrease cholesterol and LDL levels, as well as reduce weight, prevent osteoporosis, and improve flexibility, muscle strength, and endurance. Some of the health type promotioning behaviors that we need to do is encouraging the public to buy into the teaching that we're doing. They need to be motivated. They need to be ready to learn to make changes in their lifestyle in order to prevent diseases. Nutrition is important as well as stress reduction and getting enough rest. Let's look at some of the screening things that we can use throughout the developmental cycle. We'll begin by looking at health screening in the newborn. Some of the screening tests used for newborns is the PKU. Here we are looking at inborn errors in protein metabolism. The infant must have ingested a protein source to be picked up with a positive PKU. Hypothyroidism is another screening that is done. These children would appear with a very swollen face, very similar to that individual with Graves' disease. Galactosemia is a problem with, with breakdown of milk products and enzymes and is similar to a lactose intolerance. It's important to identify this because it can change the blood sugar levels of the newborn. Sickle cell disease we talk about in physiologic adaptation. This is an abnormal shaped red blood cell with interferes, which interferes with oxygen carrying capacity in the individual and presents with anemia. 
HIV is also something that we would be screening the newborn for, especially if they came from a high-risk mother. Let's move forward and look at some of the health screening behaviors we will use when we're identifying problems in the infant and child who has grown out of this newborn period. One of the first things we're going to look for is how are they developing on the Denver Developmental Screening Scales. Are they from a family that has carriers for cystic fibrosis? Do we need to identify these risk factors? Do they have a family history of an elevated cholesterol level? So we will use cholesterol screening. Lead poisoning is also something we need to monitor in both the infant and child as well as the preschool period. Neuroblastomas are types of develop, um, tumor development that can change the, the use of catecholamines and can affect the nervous system and its irritability. Let's move out of the smaller child and look at the school-aged child and the screening tests that we can use in this area. Some of the things that are used are actually even used in the schools. They can look at vision and hearing tests. This can be done in the physician's office or as a screening tool within the elementary school as a child goes into kindergarten. Heights and weights need to be monitored, as well as encouraging the child to see a dentist for dental exams. Medical assessments are done throughout the growth period and should be done at least yearly and oftentimes for camp and sport physicals. Psychosocial exams and psychological evaluations are necessary in order to pick up depression in school-aged children. Depression does exist in these young children. Let's move and look at the health screening of an adolescent. Within the adolescent, we're looking to see whether or not they're developing adequately. We're going to do PPDs to look for tuberculosis, as well as some of the sexual issues. When are they menstruating? What is their sexual activity? What type of contraceptions are they using? We're going to look at their mood or affect. Do they have signs of depression? Are they aware to do and understand how to do a breast or testicular self-exam? And if sexually active or over the age of 18, have they had a pap smear and pelvic exam? As we move out of the children and we begin to look at the adult and elderly, some of the screening tools here take on different years. They are not done every year. Growth is slowed. When we look at health screening of adults and elderly, one would be for them to continue to do breast and testicular exams. Sigmoidoscopics are begun around the age of 50 and should be done every three to five years. Stools are evaluated for blood. This has also begun at least by the age of 50 and should be yearly. Digital rectal exams are done both on men and women and should begin at the age of 40 and also be done yearly. The pelvic exam for pap testing on the adult and elderly population needs to be done at this point in time every year. An endometrial tissue biopsy is done at the st start of menopause in order to determine whether there would be signs of uterine or endometrial carcinoma. Mammographies we did talk about earlier, remember they are started and continued beginning around the age of 35 for a baseline every two years 40 to 49 and after the age of 50 every year. Other screenings that we might be doing in this population would be the types of things you see at a health fair. This would include screenings for diabetes and hypertension, as well as changes in sensory perception, such as hearing and vision testing. We're now going to move into immunizations and immunity. Let's begin by trying to develop an understanding of what an immunization should be doing. With immunity, we are finding that in, there is antigens or a foreign protein. These can be found in injections that we give. When we give a shot for tetanus, we are actually giving the body a foreign protein to prevent it from the development, to prevent it from developing tetanus. Antibodies are protective proteins. These are internal in our body. Babies get antibodies from the mom during breastfeeding, thus protecting them from various diseases as long as they are breastfeeding. Active immunity is a type of immunity that develops permanently and is created by our own body by making antibodies. Passive immunity is temporary. Antibodies are received from another source. This would be like getting a gamma globulin injection in response to exposure to hepatitis. What are some of the contraindications for immunizations? It's important for parents to understand when they can and cannot cancel physician appointments during the immunization schedule. Let's look at some of these problems. 
The first would be if the child is having a febrile illness. Also, if an individual in the household has an altered immune system. Is there someone receiving cancer treatment? Someone with HIV? Is there someone who is ill? In these cases, we would not want to immunize with a live virus. We also want to look at whether or not the child is, has had a previous allergic response to any of their immunizations. We also do not want to immunize if the child has had a recently acquired passive immunity, either through a blood transfusion or like immune serum globulin for hepatitis A. It's important for you to understand on the NCLEX what is done if a parent gets off schedule with immunizations. If a child has missed an immunization, they will, can pick it up with the next visit. If a child shows up into a health center and has no understanding or the parents have no record of their immunizations, we will have to go back and start at square one. Let's start to look at the immunization schedule. Hepatitis vaccines are given at the birth to three months, the second one from one to four months, and the third from 6 to 18 months. DPTs are given at a similar time frame. The first dose being at 2 months, second one at 4 months, third one at 6, fourth as a booster at 15 to 18 months, again in the preschool, the kindergarten years, 4 to 6 years, and then tetanus diphtheria, here we drop the pertussis from 11 to 16 years of age. Tetanus diphtheria vaccines need to be administered every 10 years. As we start to look at these schedules and go back to look at the frequency, it's important to have some idea when the mom should return to the healthcare center. Most of the time, these immunizations are given about every two years during the first year of life. Let's go back and look at HIV. HIV is a vaccine that's used to prevent flu and meningitis development. Again, the first dose is given at two months, the second one at four, third at six, and the fourth 12 to 18 months. Oral polio fits this same scheme of cycle. The first oral polio vaccine is given at two months, the second one at four, third at 12 to four years of age, and the fourth from four to six years. Now, as you start to compare these on your table, you will see that not all of these vaccines are given in the same number. It's important to know the immunization schedules. MMRs are given from 12 to 18 months of age. Many of you received an MMR vaccine as you went into college. This was because you had received your vaccine for measles, mumps, and rubella before the age of 12 months. Varicella, the new vaccine for chickenpox, is also given during this 12 to 4 year period of time. Let's move forward and look at the care associated with some of these immunizations. How do we treat the child who is having some of those mild side effects that we would expect? As we look at DPT, DPT is given in IM in the anterior or lateral thigh. It's important to know where these injections are given. Remember, this is the vastus lateralis, and it's the safest place for an injection, thus avoiding the sciatic nerve. Side effects that we see following a DPT include fever within 24 to 48 hours, swelling, redness, and soreness. We do not treat this irritability or inflammatory process with aspirin thus setting the child up for Rye syndrome. These would be expected side effects and would not require the child to come into the clinic for follow-up. MMR is given subcutaneously in the anterior lateral thigh. The side effects for an MMR include rash, fever, and arthritis 10 days to 2 weeks following the injection. Egg allergies need to be identified in these individuals as allergies to eggs may set them up for an allergic reaction to the MMR. Let's advance a little further and look at the side effects associated with both the OPV and the hepatitis vaccine. When we're looking at the OPV vaccine, it's usually given PO. It takes on two forms. It can be active or passive as far as the virus. There are few side effects associated with this. The hepatitis vaccine is another one that's given IM into the vastus lateralis or deltoid muscle. Remember, the deltoid is not used in children under the age of one year. Side effects for the HB vaccine include tenderness at the site. As we move into tuberculosis, we're going to be looking for those things we talked about in safe and effective care, in duration. TB vaccines are given intradermally, just under the skin, and show up as a wheel or bleb. They need to be evaluated 
documented and measured 48 to 72 hours after they are administered. Positive results vary depending on the immunity factors within the individual. We know that in an HIV positive patient, they may in fact have tuberculosis without having a positive TB test. We also know that with patients that are immune compromised, the TB response can be less than in the healthy public. Tetanus diphtheria is given intramuscularly in the anterior lateral thigh. It is repeated every 10 years as a vaccine to prevent tetanus diphtheria. Let's look now at some of the measles and mumps vaccines and what we're looking at when administering these vaccines. The live attenuated rubella vaccine is given subcutaneously once in the anterior or lateral thigh. It's given as an antibody to a negative woman, a woman in, in regards to not having had rubella before. Pregnancy must be prevented for three months because we know that rubella would set the mom up for high risk for birth defects if she was to conceive during this three-month waiting period. The live attenuated mumps vaccine can be given also once subcutaneously and is frequently given to fathers if children are to come down with mumps in order to prevent orchiitis or inflammation of the testes. Sterility can occur with this disease. As we move forward, we're going to move out of immunizations and into allergic responses. It's important to understand how someone looks if they are having an allergic reaction. The first thing that they may appear with is weakness, apprehension, and a possible lump in the throat. Nausea and vomiting may also follow. These would be systemic type reactions to something that we have inhaled or ingested. Cutaneous signs and symptoms of allergies are a little different. They appear as pruritus or irritation of the skin, uticardia, which is itching, and angioedema of the lips and eyelids, or slight swelling with redness. If the allergic response progresses into the lungs, we're going to get bronchial complications. Some of these will look like wheezing, which we will see in an asthmatic, rails in someone who might be developing pulmonary edema as a side effect, and diminished breath sounds. We know that with wheezing and rails, we block the ability to air to enter and leave the lungs, thus the systems will occur. Our action in this case was to keep the airway open and oxygen delivered. What if the, the allergic reaction becomes systemic in the circulatory system? In this case, the patient is going to develop hypotension. They are going to develop a rap weakened pulse, and this occurs because of histamine release. Dysrhythmias or cardiac irregularities can occur, as well as shock and potentially cardiac arrest if left untreated. So in an individual that's presenting with either early signs or systemic signs of an allergic reaction, what do we need to do? The implementations that we use for an allergic reaction include establishing an airway and rapidly administering adrenaline, 1 to 1,000. We are going to start an IV with a large bore needle and in fact may have done that before administering the adrenaline since it works more quickly when given intravenously. We are going to give rapid infusion of IV flu fluids. In this regard, we are trying to prevent signs and symptoms of shock. Oxygen is administered as well as suction and life support should be available. Some of the medications used to treat allergic reactions include antihistamines, bronchodilators, vasopressors, and corticosteroids. An individual that can develop a reaction like this could be stung by a bee 15 times in their life, but the 16th sting puts them into a position where they become diaphoretic and short of breath. Emergency intervention is necessary immediately to prevent cardiac arrest. What is an atopic allergy? These are seasonal allergies. The individual usually has a history of problems with sneezing, rhinorrhea, congestion, itching, or tearing of the eyes. Hay fever allergies or wool would be an example of this. Implementation that could be used include anything that would symptomatically relieve it, such as avoiding it, or avoiding the allergen altogether. Some people will use over-the-counter allergy medications as well or go on to allergy shots to try and control their reaction. We're now going to move out of this area into physical assessment. The NCLEX likes you to understand what the normal findings and abnormal findings are as you do a physical assessment. We're going to walk through the steps. Let's begin by looking at what NCLEX may ask. 
They may ask you the sequence that you need to use in assessing, especially in the case of the abdomen, which is a little different. How do we perform the techniques of assessment? What are some of the normal findings? And in regard to use of a stethoscope, when is the bell and diaphragm used correctly? Physical assessment can be done in any location, but it's in important to remember that the patient needs privacy. They should be draped and there should be good light. You cannot evaluate the patient without being able to see them correctly. Let's begin by looking at preparation of a physical assessment. We need to gather the equipment. Again, provide privacy in a well-lit environment and explain what we're planning on doing. We may want to have the patient void ahead of time so that partway through the procedure they don't need to get up and urinate. But remember, if we need a urinary, urine specimen, we would want to get it before or at least ask them to give it to us at the time of the voiding. We need to compare findings on one side to the other. Remember, our body should be similar and it gives us hallmark signs of changes that may be occurring. Te this is a good opportunity for teaching. If we see someone with a lot of sun or sunburn, we can talk about prevention of skin cancer. If we're looking at examining the breast, we can teach breast self-exam. Again, draping becomes important. And as we go into the physical exam, remember it's important to bring all the materials with you or equipment. Your stethoscope, the thermometer, the smegmomanometer to do their blood pressure, gloves because we do use universal precautions. Let's look a little bit at the process used in doing a physical exam. The first thing that we usually do when examining the body is to inspect, look at it, what's its color, palpate or feel for masses, percuss, which is tapping, and auscultate, listen. The exception to this, which is a frequently tested NCLEX item, is the abdomen. When we examine the abdomen, it's important not to be handling it before we have listened to it because our maneuvering of the abdominal cavity can create bowel sounds that may not have been present otherwise. Let's look at the order for assessing the abdomen. The first thing we want to do is to inspect the abdomen. What's its color? Is it smooth or rough? Do we see bumps? We are going to auscultate or listen for the bowel sounds in each of the four quadrants. We're going to palpate the abdomen for any masses and percuss to notice its tone or resonance. What are the techniques that we use when we're carrying out a physical assessment? Let's begin by looking at what we do during inspection. When we inspect an individual, we are looking for or starting first with how do they appear? Is the lighting good around us? What is their size, shape, color? It's a general survey. During this period of time, we can ask them questions about their history. We might be getting a height and weight. We are inspecting the body. Let's move on and look at the second step, palpation. When we palpate, it's important for us to warm our hands first. Cold hands will cause someone to vasoconstrict and chill. It's also uncomfortable. We need to use the fingertips for light touch or fine touch. We use the dorsum of the finger to evaluate temperature. This would be the back of the fingers. We use the palm of the hand to feel vibrations. Vibrations might be felt in the lungs over an area of consolidation. When doing palpation, we need to start lightly and then progress if necessary to a bimanual palpation. This is used when assessing ascites or even pregnancy. Here we place the sensing hand on the skin surface and actually tap on top of the hand. Bathlotment is the pushing or palpating of one hand into another in order to feel shifts. Ascites could be evaluated this way. Some of the other things that we do during assessment is percussion. As we percuss, we're looking for different sounds, and different parts of the body normally pr will produce a difference in sound. Let's talk about how we percuss. During percussion, we are going to directly strike the surface with one to two fingers. If we're in an area where this would be painful, we can do an indirect type of percussion by striking our finger over top of the surface. In other words, we would have a hand and then tap our own hand to percuss the area below it. A reflex hammer can also be used to do blunt percussion. This obviously would be used to check reflexes. Now what are some of the things we hear when we are doing percussion? Resonance is a sound that occurs over the lungs. 
It's moderate to loud, low pitched in quality. Hyperresonance is something that we hear over a child's lung or an emphysemic. It's more of a bellowy sound. It's booming or loud. Again, though, low pitched in nature. Timpani is a drum-like sound that we frequently find over the abdomen or bowels. A dull sound is found as we tap over a solid organ and flat if we tap over the bone or muscle. As we move forward, let's talk about what we might do during auscultation. With auscultation, we are going to take the diaphragm of the stethoscope and listen for high-pitched sounds. These sounds would be found in the lungs, bowel, and heart. The diaphragm should be placed firmly against the skin surface and may actually leave a ring when removed. The bell of the stethoscope is used to pick up low pitch sounds such as murmurs. It is lightly placed on the skin surface and should not leave a ring when removed. You always listen to bare skin, never through clothing or patient gowns. And if there's crackling occurring because of hair on the chest or a body part, wet the hair to decrease the crackling sensation or sounds. Now what types of things are we looking for when we do the physical assessment? As we go into this area, we are trying to get a general idea of their appearance, the patient's behavior, as well as their vital signs. We are going to evaluate their temperature, pulse by checking the rate and rhythm, and respiratory function. Here again, with evaluating respirations, we will look at rate, rhythm, as well as depth or excursion. The blood pressure should be checked in both arms and compared. The proper size cuff should be used, and it should not cover more than 50% of the extremity. Any problem with blood pressure should not be adjusted, in that if the cuff is too large or too small, we do not change the numbers. We get the correct cuff. Let's move forward and look a little further at assessment. What do we need to know on the NCLEX? Here we're looking at normal vital signs at different ages. You could be tested on terminology for breathing patterns and even some of the normal or advantageous lung sounds. We're going to go through and talk about these now. One of the first vital signs that we usually evaluate is temperature. We can identify infection or hypothermia by doing this. A tympanic thermometer is frequently used now in practice. It's placed in the ear and it checks our core temperature based on the tympanic membrane. Positioning is important. If we use an oral temperature, the normal range here would be 98.6. Rectal temperatures are usually 99.6 and are less frequently used now. Axillary temperatures may also be used and the normal axillary temperature is 97.6. Let's look at some of the vital sign changes that we might see in a newborn. As we go through the developmental stages, vital signs change. Temperature usually does not. Let's begin by looking at the newborn. Their respirations are usually 30 to 50 times per minute, and they use diaphragmatic or abdominal movements. They can be irregular in nature and have short periods of apnea, but they should not last more than 20 seconds. Their pulse rate normally is between 120 and 140 beats per minute and will increase with crying. The blood pressure ranges from 60 over 40 to 80 over 50 millimeters of mercury. As a child grows, their vital signs also change. In the one to four year old, we would expect to see respirations ranging 20 to 40 breaths per minute, the pulse 80 to 140 beats per minute, and the blood pressure somewhere around 90 over 60 to 99 over 65. Again, it's important to know these normals, not necessarily to memorize them, but be able to identify if a child was in danger. We would not expect a child in the one to four year old range to be continuing to have periods of apnea. Let's go on to look at the norms for the five to 12 year old child. The five to 12 year old child's respirations are going to be 15 to 25 breaths per minute. The pulse is going to be 70 to 115 beats per minute. You can see a decrease here. The blood pressure is starting to increase somewhat, 100 over 56 to 110 over 60. As we move into the adult, we see those vital signs that we most frequently think we will be tested on. Remember, the NCLEX tests across all age groups. As we look at the adults, we see respiratory ranges that we don't always consider normal. 12 breaths per minute is a normal respiratory rate for an adult. 
12 to 20 is the normal range. The costal area or chest moves with expiration slower than inspiration. The pulse rate in an adult is somewhere between 60 and 100 beats per minute. And the blood pressure has gone from 90 over 60, may range up to 140 over 90. It's important to know these norms so that we can identify when to screen these individuals and send them for medical follow-up when we identify elevated blood pressures. Let's look now at breathing patterns. When we evaluate breathing patterns, we need to look at whether or not abdominal respirations are being used, which would be the abdominal muscles being used for breathing. Apnea is a condition where we cease in breathing. It can be brief or prolonged. Chainstoke respirations are a rhythmic waxing and waning of respirations. The respirations increase and slow down to maybe even periods of apnea. Many times we associate this with death breathing, but we all have discharged patients with chainstoke respirations, especially as they sleep. Dyspnea is difficulty or labored breathing or shortness of breath, maybe requiring a pillow to help with sleeping at night. As we continue forward looking at breathing patterns, we come to such things as hypertonia, which is abnormally deep respirations. Hyperventilation is when we are breathing too rapidly and cause respiratory alkalosis. This would present as numbness and tingling in the extremities. Anxiety can cause this, this condition to occur. Hypoventilation is reduced ventilatory efficiency and will result in respiratory acidosis and sedation can cause this. The breathing is too shallow, we aren't getting enough oxygen in, and carbon dioxide is not being adequately exhaled. As we go forward with breathing patterns, we come to such things as Cushmol respirations. Cushmol respirations are air hunger. It's an increase in rate and depth of respiration and is frequently seen with diabetic ketoacidosis. Orthopnea is the inability to breathe except when in the upright position. Paradoxical respirations is when a portion of the lung deflates with in inspiration. This is exhibited when a patient has a flail chest. The chest is not responding in its normal movement. It should be inflating with inhalation. As we go forward, we're going to look at some patterning and behaviors. Let's look at some describers of breathing patterns. Periodic breathing is a rate, depth, and tidal volume change from one interval to the next. Cyanosis is a bluish skin discoloration that comes from unoxygenated hemoglobin in the blood. Strider is something that occurs when the breathing becomes harsh, high-pitched, and is usually associated with an airway obstruction. Cough is something that we do to move foreign matter from the lungs. It's a reflex action that is absent in newborns. As we move forward looking at assessment, we need to start to identify what does the individual look like. We talked about identification earlier in inspection. Here we're looking at physical assessment findings such as their nutritional status, their height and weight. What does the skin look like? What is, it, what is its color? Are there scars or bruises present? Is there edema or swelling? What is the temperature, texture, and turgor of the skin? Are there rashes? We continue and we go forward looking at the hair and nails. We are looking here at is there excessive hair or is there a loss of hair? What do the nail beds look like? What is their color, their shape, their contour? Is there clubbing, which is associated with respiratory problems? What about the texture and thickness? When we blanch them, what is the capillary refill time? How long does it take the paled out nail to return to pink? Normal is less than three seconds. Let's move forward and look at what we would assess in the head. As we look at the head, we're looking at symmetry and size. We are looking at their temporal arteries and at this point beginning to evaluate some of the cranial nerves. Hydrocephalus would be a disorder that would present with an abnormally large head. As we look at some of the cranial nerves, the first nerve is olfactory. This is an individual's sense of smell. Smells that are used to check the olfactory sense should be non-irritating. The second cranial nerve is the optic nerve. Here we are evaluating the sense of vision. 
through the use of a Snellen chart. The normal here would be 20-20 vision. We are looking at visual fields in the periphery and may use an ophthalmoscope to evaluate both red reflexes and the condition of the optic disc and retina. Terminology is important when we're looking at this because ptosis, which is drooping of the eyelid, is a condition that we would see in someone with a stroke or possibly myasthenius gravis. Let's go forward and look at the third cranial nerve. The third cranial nerve is ocular motor, which looks at pupillary constriction, raising of the eyelids, up and down and opening movements of the eye, and is evaluated by shining a pen light into the eye. P-E-R-R-L-A, or pupils equal round to light and accommodation, is begun with this cranial nerve. The fourth cranial nerve is a trochlear nerve. We're looking here at downward movements of the eye. Here we have the individual look down and watch our finger go up to their face. Here we're looking for tracking. Patients with head injuries cannot do this skill. They cannot track equally with both eyes. The fifth cranial nerve is a trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal nerve is involved with jaw movements, sensation of the face and neck, and we evaluate it by touching the face with a pin or cotton ball. We ask the individual to open their jaw and bite down. When we're looking at the abducens or, or sixth cranial nerve, here we're looking at lateral movements of the eye, looking up, looking down, and looking inward. Here again, they watch our finger move around and about the face. The facial nerve is a nerve that we use to evaluate some of the paralysis that may occur with strokes. Bell's palsy patients may develop problems with the facial nerve. The facial nerve provides movement and taste on the two-thirds of the tongue. It allows us to smile and frown and raise our eyebrows. We can place sweet and sour or bitter or salty substances on the tongue to check the facial nerve. As we move forward, we get into the acoustic nerve. Acoustics deals with hearing. And so as we use this eighth cranial nerve, we're looking at a sense of hearing and balance. We may ask them to listen to a ticking watch or stand with their eyes closed and see how their balance is standing near them in case they were to fall. An otoscope is used for this exam to examine both the tympanic membrane as well as any content or irritation to the ear. When you look into the ear, what you need to do is pull the pina up and backwards in the adult and down and back in the child. We know this is a frequently tested item on NCLEX and is also used when instilling eardrops. Let's go and look at the next cranial nerve. The glossopharyngeal nerve evaluates swallowing and taste on the posterior section of the tongue. Again, we can use a sweet and sour, bitter or salty substance in order to evaluate this. But in addition, it's important to check the swallowing and elicit the gag reflex. Warn the patient before you check this nerve. This is important in use when we're evaluating somebody's ability to fo swallow following a an exam where we would have numbed the throat or in a CVA patient that may have had problems swallowing in the past before we were to feed them. Let's move and look at the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is a tenth cranial nerve and is involved with swallowing and speaking. Asking the individual to say ah, you can watch the soft palate on the roof of the mouth raise and fall. It should be symmetrical. The other thing that we can do to check the vagus nerve is to ask them to speak. As we move on with the assessment of cranial nerves, we start to get into the spinal accessory nerve. Spinal accessory nerves look at flexion and rotation of the head. Here we ask the individual to shrug or move their head, shrug their shoulders or move their head side to side against resistance. In this case, we would hold our hand against their face, asking them to push against our hand. We are looking for equal symmetrical movement equal symmetrical shoulder shrug, um, shoulder shrug. The twelfth cranial nerve is a hypoglossal nerve and it deals with tongue movement. Here we ask the individual to stick out their tongue and move their tongue from side to side. Again, this is an essential thing for an individual to be able to do before we can start to feed them. They must be able to move the food from the front to the back of the mouth safely. Once we are done assessing the cranial nerves, we're going to move on to assess the eyes. When we assess the eyes, we are looking for ptosis, drooping of the upper lids, 
the color of the eyes, whether the pupils are equal, round, and reactive to light and accommodation. We are trying to evaluate for photophobia or light intolerance. We're looking for the nystagmus. And remember that nystagmus is that involuntary rapid movement that you can see the eye do when you ask them to focus on your finger. The corneal light reflex will also be evaluated, and this requires an ophthalmoscope. Corneal reflex can also be elicited, but should not be used unless absolutely necessary, as it can cause scratching of the corneal lens. Let's move on and look at the rest of the eye exam. As we continue, we need to evaluate what is the patient's visual fields. Can they see in the periphery? What is their visual acuity? And again, we would use the Snellen chart. An ophthalmoscope would be used for part of this exam. Ears are evaluated by looking at the tympanic membrane as well as assessing both bone and air conduction of sound. The Weber test is performed by placing a tuning fork on the top of the forehead as it vibrates. The individual should be able to pick up equal vibration or sound into both ears. The Rene test differs in that the tuning fork is placed on the mastoid process of the bone next to the ear as it vibrates. When the patient does not feel any further vibration, the tuning fork is then advanced to the opening of the ear and they should continue to hear vibration noise if their bone conduction is less than air conduction. A normal finding is an individual continuing to hear the tuning fork at the side of the ear once it's been removed off the mastoid bone. We need to compare both ears and to make sure that the sound is equal. Let's move on and look at the evaluation of the nose and sinuses. Here we're going to evaluate the septum. Is it straight? What color is it? What is the alignment of the nose? Is there any discharge? Are the sinuses inflamed? We can actually shine a light on the face through various maneuvers to see the sinuses in light if they are congested. The mouth and pharynx is evaluated by looking at its mucosa. What is its color and, and texture? Is it intact or irritated? How do the teeth appear? Are the tonsils present? And if so, aren't they in normal alignment and of normal size? At this point, we will elicit a gag reflex if necessary and ask the patient to swallow and evaluate their ability to do so. Taste would be evaluated when assessing the mouth. As we move into the neck, here we're trying to assess for signs of infection. Lymph nodes are placed within the cervical and neck regions and become inflamed with infections and the development of certain types of cancers. As we evaluate the neck, we are going to look for nodules as well as evaluate the trachea for its placement. During a neck exam, you stand at the back of the patient with your hands across the front of the throat and ask them to swallow as your hands rest on the trachea. The thyroid will be felt on each side and you can feel the up and down motion. You should not feel enlargement in this area. Carotid arteries are also evaluated as well as looking for jugular vein distension. When evaluating the carotid arteries, it's important not to leave your hands in place for an extended period of time, as this could slow the heart rate. The thorax and lungs is evaluated by first looking at its diameter. Normally, the anterior-posterior diameter is smaller than the side-to-side -side diameter. When we are looking at an emphysemic patient, they extend in their anterior-posterior diameter to develop a barrel chest. Tactile frematis is when we evaluate for consolidation in the lung. And what we do is place our hands on the back and ask the individual to say 99. If there's consolidation, we will feel more vibration over the area of consolidation than over the normal lung area. It's important to pick, compare, again, right to left side. As we go further doing a thoracic or lung evaluation, it's important to listen to breath sounds in all lung fields. But what do we hear in those fields? Let's start to try and define some of the terms that you might see on the NCLEX. Vesicular breath sounds are breath sounds that are soft and low pitched in quality. It's a breathing sound or breezy sound that is usually heard over the periphery of the lungs. Again, these should be equal on the right and left side. Bronchovesicular sounds are harsher sounds. This is as we climb up the pulmonary tree and are heard over the main stem bronchus. As we go further up the respiratory tract, 
we're going to be listening to a loud, coarse blowing sound when we listen over the trachea. These are bronchial lung sounds. Again, it's important to listen to all lung fields evaluating right and left. And please remember, there is no middle lobe on the left side. We have a middle area on this side, but no middle lobe. That area is taken up by the heart. Now, what would be some of the unusual signs that we might hear when assessing the lungs? One of the ones that usually pops into mind is rails. These are the crackles that we hear or gurgling sound on inspiration when the patient is developing pulmonary edema. Rails can change or move from right to left side based on positioning. In other words, we can wake the individual in the morning and hear rails on the right side, but if we turn this individual to the left, an hour or two later may hear the rails have moved. Ronchi is a musical sound that's heard on expiration. Ronchi can move with coughing. This is a good indicator in determining the difference. Ronchi is sputum that is usually blocking the airway. Wheezes are the squeaky sounds that we hear and are usually associated with asthmatics. The pleural friction rub is a grating sound or vibration that can occur when there's two areas rubbing over top of each other with an inflammatory process taking place. Friction rubs can also occur in the heart if we get inflammation of the pericardial sac. Either way, this sound is a grating, sanding sound. Let's go on and go further. As we look at a little further into a lung assessment, we also are going to look at diaphragmatic excursion. This is how far does the lung expand on inspiration and decrease on expiration. Here we are going to measure that by listening at the back as the individual inhales and then exhales. Focal resonance is evaluated by looking at something called bronchophony. Bronchophony is when we ask the client or patient to say 99 as we listen to all lung fields. A loud transmission of voice sounds comes across in the case of consolidation within the lung field. Another thing that we can look at is egophony. This is where as we listen with the stethoscope, we ask the client to say E, but in fact what we hear is A. Again, this is caused from consolidation in the lung. The last type of vocal resonance that we're going to look at is whisper, whisper pecaliloe. This is where we hear a whispered sound clearly through the stethoscope. Again, this is caused by dense consolidation of the lung. We should not hear clear sounds like whispers through the lung that is not consolidated. Now let's move forward and look at the rest of the assessment. What would the NCLEX ask us when we assess the heart? How do we assess it? What are some of the landmarks and locations? Let's begin by looking at a diagram of the heart and pointing out those key landmark areas. If we look at this film picture, or if you're using an audio tape, try and follow along. The first point that we find is the aortic sound. This is found in the second intercostal space at the left side of the sternal border. The pulmonic area is the second area that we evaluate. Here we're looking again at the second intercostal space on the left side of the sternal border. As we progress down the chest, the third point we come to is called herbs point. This is located in the third intercostal space on the left side of the sternum. The tricuspid valves can be evaluated by listening to the left sternal border, and here we will hear a rushing sound as the tricuspid valves close. The mitral valve is located at our PMI point, which is in the midclavicular line at the fifth intercostal space. During listening to heart sounds, we are evaluating both S1, the lub, and S2, the dub. We are looking here for sounds with closure. S1 is looking at the closure of the tricuspid and mitral valve and is dull and low in quality. It is the onset of the contraction, or systole. S2, the dub sound, is closure of the aortic and pulmonic valves and sound like a snap. This is the onset of the rest period, or diastole. Now let's talk about a minute about what might be different in children in relationship to the location of these sounds. It's very important to remember, we can find the PMI point during our test if we're asked a question by using our body landmarks. What intercostal space am I at? Where do I find the point of maximum impulse? 
In a child, this is slightly higher. Infants, it's at the lateral line of the left nipple in the fourth intercostal space and does not migrate to the fifth space until childhood. Let's go on to talk a little bit about what we would do during a heart assessment. When we listen to the heart, it's important to identify murmurs. Murmurs are turbulent flow over top of the valves. We also want to look for any pulse deficits. Pulse deficits is when our apical heart sounds, or what we hear when we listen at the PMI point, and compare this to what perfuses to the radial artery in the right or left wrist. Juggler vein distension is also important when evaluating total function of the heart. Juggler veins should not be distended at a 30 to 45 elevate degree elevation of the patient. Where are some of the pulses that we might look at in the body besides the heart? Peripheral pulses are found at some places such as the temporal area, the carotid arteries in the neck, the radial and ulnar arteries of the wrist, brachial artery of the bend or upper portion of the arm, depending on age, the femoral artery, the bend of the upper leg, popliteal space behind the knee, and the posterior tibial, which remember this is the inside area along the border of the ankle, and dorsalis pedis, the top of the foot near the great and second toe. Another thing we need to evaluate here is the Homan sign. The Homan sign is something that's elicited when we dorsiflect the foot or point it towards our chin and it elicits pain through the calf. This is a sign of thrombophlebitis or possible deep vein problems. Again, here we would then evaluate that area for redness or heat over the area of potential inflammation. Now, as we move forward, we've now looked at the circulatory and lung system as well as the nervous system, but we need to go back and evaluate some of the other organs of the body. Let's go back and look at the breast and axilla. When evaluating the breast and axilla, it's important to look at the size, shape, and symmetry, as well as looking for any breast engorgement or nodules. The abdomen is evaluated by flexing the knees of the client or patient and inspecting, auscultating, remember, then percussing and palpating. Bowel sounds are listened to in all four quadrants. We need to listen somewhere between 15 and they should occur in a normal range 15 to 20 seconds apart. We need to make sure that if we are identifying hypoactive bowel sounds that we have listened to each area for a minimum of three to five minutes. Now all of you can sit there at this point in time and laugh thinking with 10 patients and four quadrants, I'd spend my whole shift listening to bowel sounds. If they are not present, we need to give them time to be identified. In this area, we would also be looking at the liver and the spleen and evaluating the kidneys for CVA or costovitebral angle tenderness, which would indicate problems within the kidney itself. This is done by placing our fist on our back at the bottom of the rib cage and tapping on the patient's body. Tenderness there would indicate problems with the kidney. Let's move on and look at some of the neurosystem as far as the periphery is concerned. When we do a neurological exam of the arms and legs, we are looking to evaluate deep tendon reflexes. We use a reflex hammer for this. We are also, during a neurological exam, going to evaluate their mental status. Are they alert and oriented? What is their cerebral focus? Motor and sensory function can also be evaluated. We are looking here at strength and tone of the muscles. Do they have pain or temperature? What is proprioception or positioning like? How coordinated are their movements? The muscular skeletal system is evaluated by, again, looking at tone and strength and evaluating joints for equal range of motion, right and left, as well as crepitus. Crepitus is something that you can hear as a baseball player would rotate their shoulder, and it's a grinding sensation that can be felt and heard. Let's go on to finish the assessment by looking at the genitalias. When we look at male genitalia, we're looking at the penis and foreskin. We're also evaluating for hypospadias. This is where the meatus or opening is on the underside of the shaft. Epispadius would be when the meatus opens on the upper side of the shaft. This is sometimes tested on the NCLEX. When we look at female genitalia, we're going to put them in the lithotomy position. Remember, positioning is tested on the NCLEX. Lithotomy position is where the, in, the woman is on her back with her legs elevated in stirrups. The cervix and labias would be evaluated. 
As we look at the genitalia, we are also going to be looking at the rectum and anus. Here we're looking for whether the rectum is prolapsed or protrudes from the membrane, whether there are hemorrhoids present, which would be dilated veins of the rectal area, and in the male, assessing the prostate gland. They also evaluate the uterus and cervix of the female through a rectal exam. Stool would be evaluated as re in reference to color and consistency and the presence of blood. This ends part three of health promotion and maintenance. I thank you and again wish you good luck on your NCLEX. Goodbye.